Hi, my name's Ben Jordan and welcome to another video in our On Track Whiteboard series. Today I'm going to be talking about multiboard design again. And uh, for those of you who've seen our previous videos on this, hopefully this is another useful installment for you. Today is part three in my multi-part series and what I want to talk about today is signal and power integrity, SI and PI, in multi-board systems design context. Now, if any of you out there are like me, you may have uh, had more of a computer systems engineering uh, upbringing, let's say. I'm a computer systems engineer by qualification, and so I spent a lot of time writing software, developing code for embedded systems, uh, doing FPGA design, and it's, it's uh, been a long process for me to absorb the additional information regarding signal and power integrity as it applies to printed circuit board design. And so, so if you're like me at all, hopefully this will be very useful and help accelerate your analog skills a little bit. Um, why I want to talk about this and why it's important is, is multi, in a multi-board systems design context, there's many different areas where a, a circuit board in and of itself may be well designed and pass electromagnetic compatibility requirements it may not radiate too much. It may, um, may function correctly as designed, but the moment you partition things and start integrating multiple boards in a system, you can have some pretty strange uh, problems and electromagnetic radiation and things like that occurring that were not expected. So I wanna talk about what are some of the, the common causes of those. But the, the essential points that we're gonna look, look at today is how to look for return paths. And uh, the point, second point I wanna make is add, add more grounds than you think necessary to your board-to-board -board connections um, and reduce slew rates where possible. So let's talk about these three things. Really, it all boils down to this ground return path currents. Now, uh, by way of example, we have just a typical sort of scenario. I have this, this illustration I've done here with a power supply over here. So let's call that the power supply unit or PSU. Over here, I have a main logic board or MLB. And on that main logic board, I have a CPU, which is kind of our central uh, driving device for, for controlling everything. And just for argument's sake, I have a peripheral board here. Let's call it PER for short, peripheral board. And on the peripheral board, I have a, another device, for example, a graphical processing unit or GPU. And these boards are fed by the same power supply. So we have a VCC line and a ground to each board. So we have some ground connections. We may have a chassis connection as well to ground, to the metal enclosure that all of this is in, which may also, uh, and should if it's a metal enclosure, connect to the earth on your power input. And then we have our board to board connection in between these. And what happens is when you actually send a signal from one logic device to another, just by way of illustration over here, you have VCC, you have some bypass or um, decoupling, some people call it capacitance, and you have MOSFET switches inside the device. Let's say this is inside the chip, and that's ground. And then we have a, an output, we have a transmission line, and then we have the chip at the other end, and inside there, we probably have a MOSFET with a ground and VCC and other stuff inside the silicon. Um, for our intents and purposes, when you drive a logic one, this switch closes and your current passes, let me do the current in light blue, from current flows in a loop and it has to flow through the transmission line, charging up the gate capacitance, so it flows through there, back along our ground return path, and because the active low switch is open, the current must flow from VCC and it comes through 
any local bypass capacitor on that chip. So we've created a current loop and current's flowing this way around the loop. Now at, at high speed signal edge rates, current, the return path current wants to flow as closely as possible to the outbound uh, side of that loop. Why? Because in the scenario of we have a, for example, a PCB trace and a ground plane, It wants to follow the path of least impedance, just like water follows the path of least resistance. Current of, in high speed switching scenarios follows the path of least impedance. What that actually means is it wants to have the smallest possible area in which to fill that, uh, that charge as the voltage wave front travels down that transmission line. So, so at high speeds, current and high frequencies and edge rates current, the return path current wants to flow as closely as possible to the actual signal trace down the PCB. And the same thing happens in board to board connections across a connector or down a cable between boards. Um, but if you don't provide adequate grounding, when your, when your current outbound current is flowing down a signal trace through the connector, to the receiving device, through the dis receiving device's local bypass, and then across that printed circuit board to the ground, you're forcing all those ground path uh, of all of these different signals. Let's say they all switch at once together to logic one. All of their ground return path currents add up and are forced through this same ground pin on the connector. Now, again, at very low speeds, you probably don't even notice the effect and, it's, um, and, and the ground return is only a short transition while these gate capacitances are being charged. So the current's only temporary and then the voltages settle and you have a stable logic level. And so for very low speed, this is not going to be a problem. But if you want, if you want to have a board-to-board -board connector that's capable of doing signals, you know, over 100 megahertz or so, you have to care about ground returns and add multiple ground returns. Uh, if possible, if you've got pins to spare on your connectors, do it in between each signal or signal pair if you can. And this will greatly improve the signal integrity of your board-to-board -board interface. It will also reduce what's known as ground bounce. And that happens when a lot of signal switch say from zero to one or one to zero that ground return path whether it's he heading this way or this way uh, because all of those ground currents super superimpose on each other um, the, the 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 resistance of this single connection may be enough that the voltage change is too great and causes reliability problems in your final design and uh, this is a form of crosstalk that's, that's kind of insidious. We don't necessarily think of it as crosstalk, but it is crosstalk. Instead of having coupling from one signal to another, it's actually all the couplings of all the grounds sharing one pin that's causing the problem in this case. Uh, so definitely look out for that. Look for your return paths. Another uh, insidious problem that causes electromagnetic interference and radiation is when you don't have enough ground returns on your connector, traces of ground return path can actually go through the power supply wiring all the way around the loop back. And that's forcing your overall signal path, including its ground return, to have a greater inductance, which can cause reliability problems, but also it, it creates a big loop antenna and your product may fail electromagnetic compatibility testing and FCC compliance, CE compliance testing and so on. Um, so definitely look out for that. The solution again, make sure you have multiple ground returns on your board to board interface. Um, if you're dealing with any kind of standards like PCI Express, DDR4, uh, you'll notice that the pinout is actually scientifically engineered to include all the ground returns needed for good signal integrity and power integrity. Uh, but if you're designing your own pinout, bear this stuff in mind.
So add grounds to connectors. And thirdly, reduce slew rates where possible. When you're actually transmitting signals from one device to another, even if your product is not requiring very high speed signaling, maybe you're, you're going from one board to another just with five volts or 3.3 volts ground and uh, I squared C signals, which might run 400 kilohertz clock rate or, or SPI bus, maybe up to say 10 megahertz or 10 megabits per second. Not exactly high speed stuff, but it can still cause problems with compliance for electromagnetic compatibility. And uh, the reason for that is these modern devices done on very small silicon wafer um, silicon processes like 20 nanometers or even 65 nanometers the the sizes of the mosfets and their gate capacitances are smaller and smaller so they switch much more quickly which is really good if you're going high speed you want devices to be able to switch quickly but that high speed switching let's just um, erase some of this over here again Go back to our illustration. That high speed switching from the output of a gate along a transmission line with not good return path currents can cause ringing and also can again can cause, even if this is not a high frequency thing, when it switches, there's a lot of high frequency components in these edges. And that can cause this whole thing to become a great big loop antenna radiating uh, energy and causing interference problems and causing your device to not pass its certification requirements. So what you need to do if, if you want to reduce your pin count and not have too many grounds on the pin and you're going lower speed, you need to actually add termination to your signals to slow down these edge rates. And the simple way to do that, in most cases this is enough, is just simply add, here's a, a gate, an output of one device going through, uh, through the PCB transmission line across your board to board connector through any more PCB traces and to the receiving gate. And they have grounds and there's ground on the connector here, right? And there's, there's one board, there's the other board. The best thing to do here is add some parallel resistance and, seri and sorry, series resistance and parallel capacitance. Um, you can do it on both sides or just one side, uh, depends on the scenario. And you can do some testing to work out what's gonna work well or use a simulator. But the point of this is it actually slows down the edge rate. That is the, the turn on rate or the turn off rate of this device. Um, so, that, so that the actual uh, ground return has time to settle and the path doesn't, isn't forced outward on a big loop antenna so much at those high frequencies. You're reducing the frequency content of your of your signal so that you're not going to be radiating and failing your testing so point three reduce slew rates where possible and and just be aware of these things and uh, that's multi-board design part three i hope you've enjoyed it if uh, if you did please comment share subscribe add your comments and suggestions and questions below and i'll see you next time for another on-track whiteboard video in multi-board design.